All right, ladies and gentlemen, a formal welcome to Kabbalah, to Kabbalah and Coffee. It is wonderful to see you here on this Sunday morning, April 25th, 2021. All right, so today we are going to study um, Discourse number five, chapter three, which is going to be absolutely mind-blowing. So you picked a great Sunday to study Kabbalah with me. I want to begin. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a journey into Kabbalistic thought through looking, starting with the source, starting with the biblical source, going into the Talmud, and then explaining the Kabbalistic insight that's layered on top of that. So a few things before we start about the process. Some people ask, I've got this, I've received this question many, many times. Um, tell me what is Kabbalah? Is Kabbalah Judaism? Is it not Judaism? Is it something different than Judaism? So here's the answer. The answer is that if it's authentic Kabbalah, then it's absolutely Judaism. In other words, I can't vouch for everything that somebody says or anything that somebody may say is Kabbalah because I, I don't know what anyone or everyone is teaching. But if you're studying authentic Kabbalah, it is absolutely Torah. In fact, let's, let's take that even further. Torah is comprised of multiple dimensions. As many of you know this, and many of you know, so Torah is comprised of four primary dimensions known by the acronym Pardes. Pardes. I'm going to put that in the chat. There we go. P-A-R-D-E-S. Pardes. Or if you want to cut out the vowels, that's what it looks like. If you're wondering why I'm typing in all caps, I don't know. I feel like I should be shouting this morning. So Pardes. Pshat. Remez, drush, sod. Pshat is the simple meaning of, of a verse. Remez is the allegorical meaning. Drush is the homiletical meaning. And sod is the mystical meaning, which means that every single verse in Torah can be understood on four different dimensions, four different levels of understanding. Imagine, and this is an example I've, I've given before, back in the day, I'm talking about the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, you know, back in the day. So you had, you went to school and they had, what did they have? They had those projection machines. You know what I'm talking about? The projectors, maybe even into the 90s. I'm not sure. <coughs> the projectors. Overhead. The overhead, thank you. The overhead projectors. Where you put down a thing. I don't know what you would call it. Was it a stencil? Not a stencil. Help me out, guys. A screen? A slide. No. A slide, not a slide. Um, it's not a template. What is it? It's like a clear transparency. A clear, a transparency. transparency. Yeah, it's transparency. a transparency. There it's you go. Transparency. transparency. Yeah. Has, is that used in the medical field or no? Transparency. It was. In David and my day, we used things like that, <laughs> Rabbi, because we didn't have used... iPads when David and I went to medical school yeah. in fact, I used and that I for grand rounds. both ways to and from medical school in the day yeah. i've received if, questions from, from my kids if i was around in times of the outer revolution under chabad so listen so here's Bernardino. the thing i can relate yeah but i can I absolutely relate um, i've seen it for a while david let me tell me what we were saying sorry you got cut off yeah, i used it yeah when i was giving grand rounds i would use that because i had nothing else to show my slides there were no such things as slides or at there least you go. so how is it transparency to make it, you had no powerpoint right no powerpoint just slides so the transparency right. Right. is like this clear sheet and the text or the images appeared in black and white or in color or whatever and then it was there was light on it and then it had this little arm thing like this pixar robot head thing that would project on a on a wall or on a but screen you could you could overlay transparencies and you can peel off layers too. Boom. That's where I'm headed with this. So David, you could write this class. So here's the deal. <laughs> so, so with transparencies, you could actually layer, like if you were doing like anatomy, so you could layer bone and then muscle and tissue. And it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, even when it comes to science and medicine and biology. So you could layer different things and show like, okay, here's this layer. And then here's that layer. And here's the other layer. So in a very similar way, we have Torah, which can be understood on multiple layers. So you can, you have a single verse, but there's a layer of pshat 
simple meaning, a layer of remez, which is the allegorical meaning, like the hints in the verses, the numerology. Then you have the drush, which is homiletical, which is kind of like moral teachings that you can derive from scripture. And then you have sod, which is the mystical. So here's the deal, and this is very important. This is a general statement before we jump into the actual subject matter about the moon, which is, it is mind-blowing, which I said before. But before we do that process, we're going to go through, we're going to first cite a verse in the Torah. And we're going to notice some irregularities. Like, wait a second, something in that verse sounds wrong. Something sounds a little off. Then we're going to go to the Talmud. And we're going to read this fantastical tale that sounds like a fairy tale, a Baba Misa. And then we're going to get into the Kabbalah that makes so much sense out of it and makes it a spiritual teaching, a soulful teaching, a cosmic teaching. And we'll, we'll, we'll see where this is all headed in just a moment. I'm going to share my screen with you. Let's start with the verses themselves. We're going to go back to the beginning. This is the book of Genesis. Let's do this together. Let me find this right screen to share with you. Give me a moment, please. Okay, hold on. Do, 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 do. All right, let's see if that works. Can you guys see my screen that says Safaria on it with verses and whatnot? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 14. If you're wondering where we are in the narrative of creation, well, we're in the narrative of creation. And we just concluded the story about day three of creation. And we're now focusing on, we're now jumping into day number four. And here is what scripture says. Again, Genesis 1, verse 14. I'm going to read the English. Please follow along. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night. They shall serve as signs for set times, the days and the years. Verse 15, and they, sh and they serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the earth. And it was so. Okay, so basically God is going to hang some lights outside in the sky so that we have light with which to operate here on earth. Verse 16, this is going to be our key verse. God made the two great lights, the greater light to dominate the day and the lesser light to dominate the night and the stars. Let's continue. And God set them in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the earth, to dominate the day and the night and to separate, from, uh, separate light from darkness. And God saw that this was good. Verse 19, and there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. So this is the narrative of day four of creation from verse 14 through verse number 19. In the first, in the opening chapter of Genesis, it talks about the lights in the sky. <clears throat> so one thing I want to point out, and this is what our sages point out as the anomaly, something that triggers, immediately triggers further analysis. In verse 16, it says that God made two great lights. Now, great lights in the Hebrew are gedolim. It says, Vayas Elokim at Shnehama Orot Hagdolim. God made two great lights. And then the verse continues to say, At Hama'ar Hagadol, the great light. I'm going to take out that greater. It's really the great light to rule by day. The At Hama'ar Hakatan and the small light, Lemem Shelet Halayla, to rule at night. So the difference between the first half and the second half of the verse is that in the first half, both lights are called great, two, two great lights. Whereas in the second half, after the comma, the Torah refers to one light as great and the other light as not great. Now here it says greater and lesser. <coughs> that's, not, 
It's not exactly the, 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 the actual meaning in the English or the exact translation of the Hebrew. Ma'ar ha-gadol, gadol means great. And ma'ar ha-katan means the small. So this immediately triggers our sages to try to figure out <coughs> what, is it, what exactly is happening with these two lights. Are they great? Are they small? Is one great? Is one small? Are they both great? How did you go from one great, from two great lights to one great light and one small light? What happened? So, so the Talmud says in Tract Echulin, <coughs> there's a background story that we need to know. There's an origin story of how we went from two great lights to one great light, the sun, and one small light, the moon. Oh, I probably should have clarified. The two great, sorry, I, I just kind of assumed. The two great lights, sun and moon, the great light and the small light, again, the sun and the moon, the sun being the great light and the moon being the small light. So I have here in my next tab over, Tract de Chulin, again, from this website, Safaria, which is a wonderful resource of Jewish text in Hebrew and English. Um, take a look. Take a look at what the Talmud says. Right here, Rabbi Shimon Right here, Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi raises a contradiction between two verses. It is written, Genesis 1.16, and God made the two great lights. And it is also written in the same verse, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, indicating that only one was great. In other words, in the beginning of the verse, it says that two lights were great. And then it says only one light is great. And the other light is lesser. Hold on one second. Mm-hmm. One second, guys. I can't help you right now. I can help you soon. Okay, let's continue. So that indicates that only one was great. So the question now is, are they both great or is only one great? So here we go. Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi explains. Right, here's the answer. When God first created the sun and the moon, they were equally bright. Okay, originally they were equally bright. Then the moon said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, is it possible for two kings to serve with one crown? One of us must be subservient to the other. In other words, you can't have two two kings ruling one kingdom. You can't have two kings sharing one crown. You can't have two large lights. It doesn't make sense. It's not going to work. This town, as I wrote in the email on Friday, ain't big enough for the both of us. One of us must be subservient to the other. So God therefore said to her, the moon, if so, go and diminish yourself. So the moon complains. And what does God do? God says, you're complaining. Make yourself smaller. Right? You're the one that's saying that you can't have two, two great lights. You can't have two lights that are, that are equally as great. So then you're going to be the one. So then you're going to be the one that makes yourself smaller. That's what God says to the moon. But the narrative continues. It's not done yet. She said before him, the moon said before God, master of the universe, since I said a correct observation before you, must I diminish myself? In other words, you're punishing me for speaking the truth, right? I told you, (coughs) I told you that two kings cannot share the same crown. I said that you created a system which is not a good system. You created a system where there's going to be fighting, where there's going to be animosity, where there's going to be discord, where both the sun and me, the moon, are going to be fighting over the same crown. And I, I raise a good objection, and you tell me that I'm punished by losing my throne by losing my crown by being becoming the smaller body in the sky that's not fair so god said to her as compensation go and rule both during the day along with the sun and during the night god says to the moon here's what's going to happen you can rule at daytime You're, the sun the moon Right? You ever look up at the sky and you see the sun and the moon? You see the moon in the sky? So God said, I'll let you hang around during the day and you'll also be shining at night alone. 
She said to him, the moon said to God, what is the greatness of shining alongside the sun? What use is a candle in the middle of the day? Right? Like, I'm not going to be giving any light relative to the sun's light. No one's going to, no one uses my light in the middle of the day. So I'm useless. So you, you're not making me feel better, God. I'm still feeling a little bit, uh, a little bit discarded. So God said back to her, God said back to the moon, go, let the Jewish people count the days and years with you. And this will be your greatness. So God said to the moon, let me give you, let me give you something. Right. So I made you smaller. Right. Your 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 light is not as bright as the sun. But let me give you some compensation. And that being that the Jewish people will their calendar will be lunar based. Their calendar will be based on the moon. Perfect. So that. So are you happy now? She said to him, no. The moon said back to God. <clears throat> but the Jewish people will count with the sun as well as it is impossible that they will not count seasons with it as it is written and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. In other words, the Jewish people are not only going to use the moon for their calendar, they're also going to use the sun. As, as you and I know, the Jewish calendar is actually not simply a lunar calendar. It's actually a lunar solar hybrid, right? Because we add a leap year, every few years, which is an extra 30, an extra month, a full extra month, a second Adar, in order that the holidays line up in their seasons, that Passover should be in the spring, that Sukkot should be in the fall, in order for the holidays to be aligned with the seasons, you do take into consideration the solar calendar as well. And thus you add an extra month every two or three years to the Jewish calendar. Because uh, the lunar calendar, the lunar year, 12 lunar months is only 354 days, as opposed to 365 and a quarter of the solar year. And thus, every three years, the Jewish calendar is a good 33 days behind the solar calendar, which means that Passover year one is April 1st. The next year, it's March or February. And then it gets earlier and earlier. So you have to reconcile by adding an extra month every few years. There's an elaborate system of the Jewish calendar that reconciles the lunar and the solar calendars together. So the moon is saying to God, what? You're telling me that the Jews are going to be exclusively counting by the moon? It's not so. They're also going to be counting their calendar by the sun. So you're not, give, you're not doing anything for me, God. Right? You're not throwing me a bone here. You told me to make my... I, I raised a valid complaint. I went to HR. I said, you're putting us in an impossible situation. Right? You then went ahead and punished me for speaking out. And then you're trying to tell me, well, you're going to shine during the day. Thank you very much. I don't, I'm, there's, no, there's no utility to my shining during the day. Well, you get the, the Jewish calendar. The sun also gets the Jewish calendar. Here we go. Let's continue. God said to her, third attempt to appease the moon. Go, let righteous men be named after you. Just as you are called lesser Hakatan, light, there will be Yaakov Hakatan, Jacob, our fourth father was called Yaakov Hakatan, Jacob, the small, the humble, Shmuel Hakatan, the Tana, David Hakatan, King David. In other words, great people, great righteous people, will be named after, will, will also be called small. In other words, you think small, being made smaller is a liability. It's actually a virtue. And some great people will be named after you. They'll also be small. <clears throat> That's what God says to the moon. Let's continue inside. God saw that the moon was not comforted. In other words, we don't have a recording in this narrative of what the moon says back to God, but, but the moon is basically frowning at this point, right? You know that face in the moon, like the little man in the moon? At this point in the story, super sad face, super sad, unhappy, you know, not appeased face going on over here. The moon was not comforted. Oh, I'll name, I'll name these great people that are humble after you. Not working. Here we go. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, 
bring atonement for me since I diminished the moon. You know what that means? God is saying, God is saying, you know what? I'm, I, I was wrong. I, I messed up. Or I did something that needs atonement since I diminished the moon. <clears throat> My bad. The Talmud notes, and this is what Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says. Rish Lakish says, what is different about the goat offering of the new moon, the Rosh Chodesh, every Rosh Chodesh in the temple back in the day, they would bring a goat offering. What is, the, what is different about the goat offering that it is stated with regard to it for the Lord, right? It's for Hashem, La Hashem. It's brought for God. The Holy One. What, and there's of all the sacrifices, this one is say, it says about the goat of Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, the new month, it says that this one is brought for God. Why for God? The Holy One, blessed be he said, this goat shall be atonement for me for having diminished the size of the moon. So to atone for my action of making the moon smaller, which I admit now was not so whatever, not so good. Thus, I want you to bring for me an atonement offering every month on the new month that begins with the new moon, I want you to bring an atonement offering for me for having diminished the moon. That is the end of the story. You see that little uh, squiggly right down there before Avasi? That means it's a new, a little bit of a new discussion. And there was a squiggly before we started today's uh, Talmudic passage about the two great lights to indicate that, again, it's a standalone passage. All right, so that's the story. That is the story, my friends. We have now a story of the Talmud analyzing a verse in Scripture, Genesis 1, what was it, 1, 16, 1, 15, which one? Who remembers? 1, 16. 1, right, 16. Have, yeah, 1, 16. We have the verse. Talmud says, why two great, then one great, one small? Because the moon spoke up. And the moon spoke up, and the moon got pushed down. The moon got diminished. And the moon got diminished, and then she complained, and then God said, well, what about this? That's no good. What about that? That's no good. What about the other? That's no good. And finally, God says, you're right. I'm wrong. Forgive me. Bring an atonement offering for me every new moon. <clears throat> That's the story. I want to ask you a question. Does that make sense? Any of that story make sense? <laughs> Good luck making sense of that story. It's a nice Baba Mike. It's a nice fairy tale. Nice. I, I don't know if it's nice, actually. I, I don't know what the point is. The point is, what's the end of the story? That God messed up, but he's, but he's not going to take it back? I mean, the obvious question is, well, if God recognizes that it was a mistake, if the moon is right, that it shouldn't get punished for speaking up, so what's the obvious question? Finish off the question for me, please. Then why didn't God... Help me out here. Someone on mute. Make it the way he wanted it at the beginning. Yeah. So why didn't God reverse it? Why didn't God say, you know what, Moon, you're right. You're great once again. No, no. God makes, keeps the moon small. What's going on here? What is going on here? So I want to explain this according to Kabbalah. Jewish mystical thought. And in order to do this, we have to understand that we're no longer talking about the sun and the moon as we know it. We're talking about the concept now of sun and moon. The concept of sun and moon. What's the concept of the sun versus the moon? So what's the relationship between sun and moon? At night, let's say you have a full moon and the sky is bright and the earth is being illuminated by the light of the moon. I want to ask you a scientific question. Where is the light of the moon coming from? The sun. The, the sun. The sun. The moon does not have its own light, which is the upshot of the story of Talmud, by the way. Right? God took away its own light. But hold on. The moon doesn't have its own light, which means, and, and whose light does it have? It has the sun's light. So in the language of Kabbalah, we would call the sun the mashpia, 
and the moon, the Makabel. Rabbi, just, I just I, drop that into the chat. Hold on one second, Yaakov. We have Mashpia and Mechabal. Mashpia means the giver. And Mechabal is the recipient. If you want to know how that's spelled, again, I just wrote that into the chat. Mashpia is the one who's giving. Mechabal is the one who's receiving. So, for example, when it comes to, when it comes to teaching, right? Mashpia would be the teacher. Mechabal would be the student. When it comes to a conversation, the one who's speaking is the mashpia, and the one who's listening is the makabo. And then when the when the conversation turns, the other one is the mashpia, and the other one is the makabo. Right? It keeps on switching back and forth in a dialogue. So mashpia is the one who's influencing. The makabo is the one who's being influenced. So between the sun and the moon, which one is which? Vis-a-vis -vis its light. So the the sun is the mashpia. The sun is the one who's giving the light, and the moon is the one who's makabo. The moon is receiving the light of the sun and then sharing it with others, right? When the sun is not aligned in a way that it can directly shine on certain parts of the earth, the moon at certain times of the month can reflect the sun's light to planet earth, redirect it. So the, the moon is not the mashpia of the light. It's not the originator of the light. It's the makabal. It's the one who's receiving the light in the beginning. The moon was as bright as the sun, which indicates a type of creation where, oh, one, well, sorry, I missed one point. Quick rewind of like 10 seconds. On a cosmic level, Mashpia Makabu referred to, to, to God and creation. God is the giver, creation is a recipient. God gives life. And we receive life. God is the mashpia, and we're the makabo. God is the sun, and we're the moon. We try our best to reflect God's light in this world. However, in the beginning, the two luminaries were both great, the Torah says. God made two great luminaries, which means that originally, in the original formula of creation, created beings were as pure and as perfect as the source. In the language of Kabbalah, there wasn't a filter. What we know as a tzimtzum, there wasn't a diminishing of the light in order to spawn creation. Creation was a perfect reflection of the source which means infinite source, infinite creation. So the moon says to God, so what's the point? Right? You're infinite, your light is infinite, and now you're creating a realm or a created entity that shares your infinite blinding light. Both luminaries are great. The sun and the moon are great. So what's the point? What is the point of creating a realm in which the light automatically is already shining? And God says, you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. Go and diminish yourself. And what that means is God is saying that no longer, no longer will creation automatically be as bright as the source. Creation will not have light by default, it will be a dark place. The world will be spiritually a dark place, a cold place, an indifferent place, a place that by its own accord could and does deny a creator. Where the world itself and people say, Aniva Afsi Od, it's me and nothing else. I alone exist. I don't believe in any intelligent source. I don't believe in any divine source that created me. God said to the moon, you made a good point. You make a good point. <clears throat> no longer will creation automatically see my full light. On the contrary, creation will now be 
shrouded in spiritual darkness. <clears throat> and the purpose is that on our own, we should discover the light. What the moon is saying to God essentially is a world in which God is easily found, not easily found even, a world in which God is obvious and apparent is a world that serves no independent function and utility. There's no challenge in a world where God is obvious, where the truth is obvious, human beings play no role. What do we do? We become robot robots. We're robotic. We're automons, Automa, automaton, whatever. We, we are like, what, what's the word that I'm saying? I'm trying to say? Automaton. Automaton. There you go. That sounds even better. We are automatons. We are robots following a script, right? If it's obvious and clear, free choice is taken away. And thus we become robotic spiritual beings following the script following the light that's so obvious, doing what ought to be done because it's part of our nature and we wouldn't dream of anything else. And while that sounds perfect, and it literally by definition is perfect, that's what we're talking about, a perfect scenario. When we think about the role that we would play, we soon realize that there's no role at all. You know, we're, we're coming on an age where artificial intelligence is becoming more and more advanced. Can you imagine a scenario where actors are replaced with artificial intelligence? Can you imagine? Imagine you're, you're a director or a screenwriter and you're casting your new film, huge blockbuster film. You have a choice now, right? And this is going to happen in a few years. You have a choice. You can either cast actors of flesh and blood and pay them. You know, you want top, uh, top talent? Oh, you're going to pay for it. 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, whatever, whatever the going rate is. It's been a while since uh, I hung up my acting career. So I don't remember. I'm kidding. Right. But I don't. So who, who knows the pay scale nowadays? But so that's your choice. And these are actors that you have to take care of their needs and they have trailers and they need the water and the whatever, the avocado toast, like all the stuff that they would need in order to, to pull off the thing. And then they have to remember their lines. And then, then there's the chemistry. And then there's, you know, between the actors on set and then the crew and all that stuff. Or behind door number two, second option, right, is artificial intelligence, right? Any character that you want, you can make it look as real, you know, as real as a human being, which, by the way, is now a thing. You can even take pictures of people, right, and create what they call now deep fakes, which is videos that are um, virtually not 100%, but to the naked eye, very, very close to, to passing for um, that original, uh, that original um, individual. And you can tell with artifacts, if you go really do a deep dive into it, you can see that it's, it was uh, produced. It's not, it's not authentic. Nonetheless, technology is getting there to the point where soon that, that also will be eliminated. Getting back to my point, you're the director of this film or the producer or whatever it is, and now you have a choice. Second option is you, through your computer team, right, through your programmers, you can have the actors with all the lines perfectly with all the emotions you dial it up as you want it and it's perfect and it's perfect and there's no resistance there's no resistance from your actors there's no tension there's no challenge there's no like are they going to mess up the scene are they going to get the scene right there's no room for, there's no error there's no possibility for, for error. It's you put in whatever you want, and that's what you're going to get 100% of the time. I know what you're thinking. Maybe, well, can, could a computer algorithm, whatever it is, ever get it exactly right like human emotion? I'm not writing this technology, but let's just say, yes, it could. What you've done is you've taken away any room for human error or any, not room, but any 
margin of human error because there's no more human involved. Sounds perfect. Perfect. And under budget, right? You don't have to pay like you don't have to pay now $50 million to your to your actors because it's all being done by computer. <laughs> the world could have been created in a way where all of us saw the light. I don't mean that in any like weird way, but I mean spiritually, where all of us were completely aware of the source completely aware of our souls, completely aware of our purpose, without any tension, hesitation, interruption, any dissonance, any resistance in between. We would be perfectly attuned to truth, perfectly aware of purpose, and perfectly motivated to carry out our purpose. And in such a world, we would have perfection, but we would be lacking true significance and value. We would be lacking significance and value. Because in my scenario with the film, you are not going to give any more a best actor or best, right? Best actor. Do they do actor and actress? They do actor. But I thought everyone was called actor. They still do actor and actress. I've been saying actor for both for right it's just because I thought that's what all right I thought we were fine anyway back to the story you're not going to give an Oscar award to the actor or actress of that film if they're a computer code correct correct because they didn't do anything are you with me on what I'm saying it would you go to give, the special effects producer. Oh, you might give to, right. You might give to the programmer, but you're not going to give to the character because the character didn't do anything. In a world where the light, again, light is a euphemism for divine awareness and presence and, and, and that obvious reality. In a world where divine light is ever present, guess who doesn't have a role? You and I. I, th I think I did that opposite. You and I, we don't play a role. We don't have any significance in a world where the light is shining brightly. In a world in which there's no distinction between the light of the sun source and the light of the moon creation, where the lights are identically blindingly bright, the moon, or more specifically, the creatures of the moon, that would be us, don't play a role you do a mitzvah you do a good deed obviously you stay out of trouble obviously where was the challenge where was the temptation there is no temptation in a world in which the light is shining brightly so the moon says it's not it's not as much about sharing the same role as the sun i.e two kings sharing the same crown i.e jealousy According to Kabbalah, the complaint of the moon was, what role do I play? As creation, what role do I play? Where do I come in? If your light is shining here like it does in the source, so then I'm not here. You're, so then you're there and you're here. So then who am I? What's my identity? Where's my individuality? Where's, what's my role? Where's my purpose? Where's my challenge? Where's my success? Where's my joy? Where's my heartbreak? But where am I in all this? So God says, good, good gazat. You said, well, good, you're right. Go and diminish yourself. And without getting into all the details of that story, in other words, how the rest of the story plays out with the back and forth, I want to cut to the end where God says, and bring an atonement offering for me every month on Rosh Chodesh. Not that God regrets, I asked the question before, if, God, if, if the moon ultimately triumphs in her argument with, with God saying, you didn't, you shouldn't have diminished me, so how come God doesn't reverse it? The moon ultimately wasn't saying, I don't want to be diminished. The moon was essentially saying from the beginning that I do want a function, I do want a purpose. So that's why God doesn't go back on it because that is how the world needs to be. The moon, i.e. creation, needs to not have its own light. 
It needs to be the one that needs to find and reflect the divine light of the sun. It needs to be a realm. We need to live in a realm in which by nature, we don't see God. The default setting of this world is opacity. We don't see God. The curtains are drawn. The tzimtzum, the contraction, divine contraction that blocks the light from coming down is real. It needs to be like that. It needs to be a situation where we don't see the light. But what does God say? Bring an atonement offering. Because at the end of the day, I know this. I know that it is going to be a struggle and it's going to be a challenge. And my light, my light that's being diminished, because at the end of the day, it's God's light that's being diminished from this world or being, I don't want to say blocked, but being kind of distanced from this world. <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's God's light that is... Um, that is being held back. But today we're going to take it even a step further. Because in order to create this realm, this moon realm, there needs to be light that does filter in to our realm. But the light that comes in is a light that itself is a hidden light or an opaque light. So let me explain. In order to have this realm alive, it has to be powered by divine energy. So in this world, to create this moon-like setting where the light is not shining, even though there needs to be divine light powering this world, so we have a type of divine light that doesn't look divine, right? It's kind of an incognito light, divine light. It's divine light and energy that doesn't obviously look like divine light and energy. It's hidden, it's opaque, it's shrouded, and it's concealed. And this is really where we are going to pick up our story inside our text today, which is going to be absolutely magnificent. We're going to talk about the light of God that comes into the world to create the world. Really, it's worlds plural because there are, there are multiple worlds, as Kabbalah explains, multiple dimensions that are being powered along this continuum of, of creation until it gets to our lowest physical reality. We are at the end of this creation chain called Seder Hishtal Shalut. We are at the, at the end of it, and we are the lowest, the lowest beings, lowest in the sense, the most, the, the beings that receive or, or, or visualize or take in the least amount of divine light. The divine light is the most hidden here, and yet there is a divine light that powers the space. But the divine light that powers the space has been so obscured that you can't tell that it's divine light anymore. What we call it, like words like nature. Mother nature. It's like, oh, wow, how beautiful the world is. Nature. Who's nature? What's nature? So, right, so we know, we know, Judaism teaches that nature is none other than God. But it doesn't look like God. Why? Because, I don't know, because it, no one says that. The tree doesn't say Hey, God created me, right? Doesn't say it, obviously. Doesn't say it. Um, doesn't make any profound and, and grand announcements. It just looks like a tree. So the divine energy that flows into the world to create it is doing so in a way of concealment. And this creates the possibility or the, I would say, the, um, the default reality that we don't see God. And thus, we have to find God and fight for God at every moment. I say fight for God. I don't mean in any weird religious war context. I mean fight to find spiritual experiences and spiritual moments. Sure. Okay. You want to say hi? Okay. So very quickly. Reva, say hi to everybody. There we go. Okay. On your way. All right. Back to... <laughs> Back to our story. Let me check in with you. Does this make sense so far? Yes. Questions, uh, comments? Yeah, Rabbi, the um, <clears throat> Talmudic uh, parable, is that just kind of created um, just to demonstrate uh, the relationships and to maybe explain what happened in, a, in human terms or anthropomorphic terms? 
Yeah, good question. When the Talmud tells a story, is it a literal? Is it meant to be taken literally, or is it allegory? Is it like a, a lesson? So it's a good question. But many commentaries say that yeah, this story, amongst others, is meant to be taken allegorically and not literally. Not that there was a literal necessarily a literal lesson of, of the of the moon, although maybe it also manifested it manifested itself on that level. It's possible. Um, but many stories of the Talmud are meant more of, a, of, of an allegory or a metaphor to teach us something else. In fact, we did a course a number of years ago, a six-week course called Curious Tales of the Talmud, where we went through the most, I would call them bizarre, strange, you know, super out there stories of the Talmud. And we explained, according to Kabbalah and other sources, we explained what the stories really mean. And we quoted over there at the beginning of that, of that course that many commentaries say that if you study it, if you're learning these stories literally, then you're actually missing the point. Right? They're really meant to have these morals and teachings and deeper spiritual lessons and not just meant to be a debate between the moon and God, which has nothing to do with our lives. It's meant to be understood as, a, as an instruction, really as a information for life like the story of the moon is really instructive a person goes through life and realizes one day it would be so much easier if i had clarity if things were obvious, if things were clear if god would speak to me and tell me what i need to do that would be so much easier how come that's not the case it's the talmud answers because then you wouldn't have a purpose or because then your the significance of your actions would be greatly diminished because if it was so obvious and so clear so then you would be following orders you would be a robot and and where would you be you would be like that artificial intelligence actor and you wouldn't be an actor that wins an award or that or the opposite right you but there wouldn't be you wouldn't be there it would be kind of imposed and forced upon you and so my, that's a long answer. The, to, the short answer is, yes, these stories, many stories of the Talmud are understood to be allegories to deeper ideas. It's actually my intention over the summer to teach that course again, Curious Tales of the Talmud. It's been a while, and many of you have not studied that, have not taken that course, and I, many others have not taken that course, and I think it's, a really, it's really fun because it's storytelling, it's primarily storytelling, and it's... Um, storytelling and mysticism it's a, it's a lot of fun so my intention is to teach that course stay tuned for more information as uh, as 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 uh, as it comes together all right any uh, other questions yes yeah. Donna. so can you further comment on um well i'm giving the moon to the jewish people for the calendar yeah and also the timeline of that yes yeah, so well okay so two things number one in the mystical understanding, there are ways to explain the full dialogue between the moon and God, but I don't recall all the details. I would have to go back to the sources and take a look. I'm giving you kind of like the overall deeper understanding of the story where two, the sun and the moon being of equal brightness indicates a world in which, by default, truth is obvious. The moon saying this is not a good system is basically saying, if it's obvious, then, then why am I here? Right. What what, where, what role do I play? If it's if you're imposing your reality here, then then you don't need me. And so God says, you're right. Let me give you space. But if I give you space now, it's going to be challenging. So that's where that. So that's the overall arc of the dialogue. I think your question is maybe in a more practical level. So when did the Jewish calendar begin to operate by the moon? Is that the question? Well, also the question like we weren't a Jewish people right at that at creation. Right. Correct. So that happens in the Jewish count of years in the year 2448, right before the Exodus. God gives Moses the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, of the new moon, of the new month. That happens um, in the book of Exodus shortly before, um, like 15 days before the Exodus. Yeah, sure. Hold on. One second. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very talented. Got it. Um, okay. So, so that happened shortly before, about two weeks before the Exodus, the Jewish people get the Jewish calendar by the moon. Um, 
God is foretelling to the moon, again, in the, in the basic narrative, there will come a day when the Jewish people will count their months by you. So therefore, that's, does that make you feel better? Again, how that works with the mystical understanding of it, it works. I don't recall all the details, but overall, that's the, that's the general theme. Any other questions or comments or clarifications before we move inside? Okay. There would, there would be no Yom Kippur if uh, we were automatons and uh, everything was obvious. Correct. There would be no Yom Kippur, Day, Day of Atonement. But, but even, even from a level of, of doing good, good that's done when it's forced is not... In other words, you would have the end result. I mean, that's even debatable. You would have the good thing would be done but you wouldn't have anybody doing it really. It wouldn't be us. It wouldn't be me who was doing a mitzvah. It would be God doing the mitzvah because it's still, when you have the artificial, the AI actor, you know, doing the scene, it's not the actor who's doing the scene. It's the programming who's doing the scene. It's the programmer. It's the, right, that's not. Okay. So back. So let's get back to our story. We're talking about in our text, which I'm going to share the screen in a moment. We're going to go inside. We've been talking about the energy called Malchut, which is the lowest of the ten, which is the lowest of the ten huh? spirit. It's the lowest of the ten spiritual energies that exists in this continuum within each and every world. Each and every dimension has ten energies known as Sefirot. And the lowest is Malchut. And it's Malchut, we've said, that goes down into the worlds to create them. It's the lowest level of these energies that is the most relatable to the dimensions that exist beneath it. So it can relate to them, it, can, it creates them, it becomes their source. The lowest of the upper level becomes the, the uppermost point of the lower level. So it exists kind of in relation to the other. So whereas the other nine energies of, let's say, the world of Atzil, the world of emanation, the other nine energies relate to self, Malchut relates to the other, kind of like a name, which, doesn't re which you don't need for yourself. A name is needed for the other. Or like speech, you don't need to speak for yourself. You need to speak for the other which is why, or like a cup, which is the utility of the cup is to share the liquid with some other entity. A cue for a drink. So Malchut is called a cup. It's called a name. It's called speech, all indicating that its purpose lies not in what it does for self, but what it bestows to other. And so we said, as the lowest of the energies, as the lowest, 10 out of 10, the lowest of the energies. It is in a state of spiritual thirst. This is the key word. It's in a constant state of spiritual thirst, thirsting for source because it faces other. It faces the outside. It's the one energy that relates to the other, to the lower, to the outside. It therefore, on some level, yearns to be facing the other way, back to its source, back to where it comes from. In other words, its mission is to face down, to face out. But on some level inside, what it wants is to face God, to, to turn around and to face the source. So on an existential level, Malchut lives with tension. On the one hand, it wants to be back. It wants to be connected with source. But what's its function? What's its role? To face forward, to face away from source and down from source. Today, we're going to learn that this goes even deeper. That the thirst of Malchut is even deeper because Malchut doesn't just face and create the worlds that are beneath it. 
But Malchut is the energy that actually goes into those worlds, including ours, descent after descent, level after level, right down this ladder of descent until it becomes the life force, the lifeblood, so to speak, of our existence. And it's what flows through everything in our reality, including all of the negative things that happen on earth. Everything that happens on earth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is all, if it happens, it means that there is a life force that flows through it. And that life force is, is a divine life force. And that means that Malchut, the energy that we said last week and the week before, faces forward, but really wants to turn around and go back home, not only is facing forward, but ends up in the lowly, low, lowliest of realms, being an accomplice to all sorts of nefarious behavior. Are you with me on that? What do I mean by Malchut is an accomplice? Because no evil could be done if there wasn't life in that space, if there wasn't a form of vitality, Dr. Maxi, go ahead. So by the same token, is Malchut what's involved in Teshuva? Correct. Malchut is that energy, the divine energy that flows and gives life, gives possibility for everything to happen, good, bad, or ugly. So whether it's a mitzvah, whether it's the opposite of a mitzvah, Right, a good deed, the opposite of a good deed, whether it's shuva coming back from the from from the from the dark side, whatever it is, it's all being powered by Malchut. But you can imagine that if Malchut was thirsty for source, just just because it was just due to the fact that it was facing another direction, can you imagine when it's actually in that lower space <clears throat> and now being swept against its will into all sorts of dark places, can you imagine how thirsty it is for its source? Can you imagine how much it wants to go back home and be reunited with source? It's, it's in a fierce fashion it wants to go back. So now Rabbi, I'm going to share my, yeah. Um, so if Malfoot is uh, uh, focused on downward, but really yearns to turn back around and go home, um, do we do the same thing? And if so, where, how, you know, because we're distracted by not only the ridiculous things that we're bombarded with every day and the difficult things, but also like that beautiful sunny day outside. And, um, you know, should we be focusing on the beautiful parts of uh, God's emanation, the Elohim, you know, creation, nature, because that is God. Literally, it's not man made. It's God made. Or right. should, and, and how do we not get distracted when we're out there to know that? Um, hey, this is really all of this is oneness or, you know, because if we're out there in a spiritual slowing down mode, then we can, you know, get to that oneness or inspiration. But if we just plow through it, then we yeah. just try. Uh, I'm, I'm with you on the question. So I, I think like this, I think the where he's going with this in the immediate context is not necessarily how do we recognize that the energy flowing through creation, even in those dark spaces, is malchut. That's your question. I don't. He's not addressing that right now. We may address that soon, but he's not addressing that in the immediate. What he's addressing is, let's think about Malchut right now, the energy itself. The energy itself is in that space with all of the other nine energies, but its mission is to face forward, to face downward. And then it's pushed off the cliff, so to speak. And it actually hurdles through those dimensions and all the way through, it is the force. It is the force that gives life to all of those lower dimensions and realms until it gets to our world. And it's also flowing through here. And yes, you're asking, so, but how can we become aware of it? And I, I mean, I don't know if there's a short answer to that. It's meditation and study, but here's the point. How does the energy itself feel? It feels thirst. It yearns. It's similar to the journey of the soul which wants to be reunited with source, but is found now stuck in a body on planet earth, right? Trying to make this person into a mensch. But meanwhile, half the time, it feels like it's a losing battle, right? And maybe I'm being generous with half the time, but it feels like, or maybe I'm being too cynical. I don't know. It depends on the, I'll let you decide, right? So 
half the time the soul may feel like, what am I doing here? I don't even want to be here. I'm stuck with this, with, with, with this situation. I'd rather be home. So on the one hand, it's here. On the other hand, it wants to be elsewhere. This is also the energy. This is also the, the state of the divine energy flowing through the world as well. I'm going to share my screen with you. And we still have to Let's do deal this with inside. We still have to deal with everything. Like, um, you know, when tragedies happen, we, we are just emotional managers. If we don't deal with the negativity and process it, then it could really affect us uh, even worse. So, yeah. yeah. Take a, can you guys see, see the screen? It's a little bit cut off. Can you guys see that chapter three? Is it coming out? Cut off. Yes, but can you see, but, but can you see this, uh, the PDF? Okay. The good news yeah. is it's cut off right at the edge of the line. So it's, um, it shouldn't be cut off too much. I think, I think we're getting most of it. I think actually we're getting all of it. Okay, here we go. Thirst also due to descent. Another reason for the thirst of Malchut. Why is Malchut thirsty? Again, this is a translation of a biblical verse from Deuteronomy that set, talks about that which is sated or satisfied and that which is thirsty. And we said, according to Kabbalah, the element that is thirsty is this level of Malchut, this energy of Malchut. Malchut is thirsty. Why is it thirsty? Because it's forward-facing, but rather what would rather be connected with source. He says another reason for the thirst of Malchut is its descent, not just because it's forward-facing, but because it actually descends. This is what I was trying to express just a few moments ago. It's one thing to say that Malchut, it relates to the outside or relates to the other or the lower realms, but it's quite another to say that it actually descends to those lower spaces. So that's why it's really thirsty. And this descent, which was necessary for it to become a source for physical beings. Let's continue. This descent of Malchut. Malchut is the divine energy that flows into the worlds, including into ours, that powers everything. What Yaakov said before, it's the power of nature. It's the Elohim. It's, all, it's Malchut. Same thing. This energy engenders, sorry, this descent of this energy engenders, creates, stirs, spawns the intense rutso a fierce desire, the thirst to rise from its debasement. All Malchut wants is to rise from its debasement and go back home. This also explains the aforementioned teaching from the Zohar, from Kabbalah, that from the He came the Yud. It says that from the He right at the top of this page, at the end of last week's class, we said the hey becomes a yud. What does that mean? So here we here he explains. The yud is symbolic of the higher realms and hey is symbolic of the lower realms, right? It says, there's a, there's a quote here from the Talmud. It says with the yud, the letter yud, God created the world to come. In other words, the higher spiritual realms. So i.e. that is the yud is the source of life for the souls, for spiritual realms, but not for bodily life. So the Yud creates the spiritual realms. The Yud creates the soul. The Yud creates spiritual energy, but it's not the physical stuff. Therefore, the letter He that descended to become the source of life in this mundane world longs to ascend from its descent to its source. That's what it means from the He. The He is trying to move into the space of the Yud. The He, which is the energy, that descends into this world to sustain bodily life, physical existence, wants to revert back and become the Yud, wants to, wants to go back to the source, to the spiritual space. In other words, Malchut, let's get back to the, to the language of Kabbalah here, Malchut, which is the slowest of the ten Sfirot, Malchut, which goes into physical reality, Malchut, wants to go back home. Malchut wants to go back up. Malchut wants to reunite with its source and to bust out of Dodge. So Malchut is here. Everything that we see, the world, us, everything, physical existence is powered by Malchut, but the life force itself, the battery pack itself, the light and energy itself wishes to be elsewhere. It's thirsty. 
It yearns for another reality, a spiritual reality. This is similar to our sage's statement. This is again from, oh, sorry, this is from Tikkun Ezar, actually, from Kabbalah. It says, the lower waters weep, saying, we want to be in the presence of the king. The lower waters are crying. The lower waters say, we want to be with the king. What does that mean? Let me explain for a moment um, and really go back to the story of creation that we mentioned earlier. It says on day number two, day number two of creation, that God separated the waters. God separated the lower waters from the upper waters. We have two dimensions of water. Water below, lakes, oceans, rivers, seas. And then there's the water above the firmament, the heavens. And it says that on day number two of creation, that God separated the lower waters from the upper waters. In fact, let me see if I can pull this up on my end, and then I can share it with you. Give me a moment. Um, might as well. Might as well share this with you. Give me a second. Here we go. Second day of creation, verse six. We now went back. We were studying the fourth day of creation before the beginning of the class. Now we're going back. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water that it may separate water from water. So God is separating between two entities of water. God made the expanse and it separated the water which was below the expanse from the water which was above the expanse and it was so. God called the expanse sky and there was evening and there was morning a second day. So on day two, God separated lower waters from upper waters, waters below the expanse from waters above the expanse. And so this is what happened on day number two, God separated the waters. So the Zohar, Tikkun Zohar says, again, a mystical source, it says that the waters, the lower waters, weep. They cry. The lower waters cry. And they say, we want to be in the presence of the king. Why did we get relegated to terrestrial earth? We want to be closer to God. Again, is God up there in the sky? No, but it means conceptually, we want to be less physical and more spiritual we would rat why, why did we get the um the short end of the stick the raw end of the deal whatever the the cliche is why did we get stuck with being the lower waters we want to be near god near the king that is the complaint or that is well that's the desire of the lower waters let's uh, i'm going to share my screen with you once again let's get back into our text me a moment to find it hold on there we go okay so this is similar the yearning of malchut is similar to what our sages say about the water the lower waters we, we want to be in the presence of the king right water water causes all sorts of delights to grow um physically all sorts of temptations are created and spawned and 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 made even more delectable by water. So lower waters are the source of physical delights. This is a grave descent for the divine light to become a source for material pleasures. Imagine divine light that's now in its current role, a source of material pleasures. That my how, my how the mighty have fallen. You take pure divine light and you send it down, 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 down on a mission. And it evolves into what? Lower waters that are now growing all sorts of physical foods and other temptations. That's what happened with the divine light. It's like at a high school reunion, right? 30 years later, whatever happened with uh, Schmerl, Yankel, Schmerl, whatever. They had so much potential. And now look, look what's going on, right? The, the starts off as divine light. And now it's the source of material pleasures. This is where the lower waters have fallen. They, let's continue, they thus weep over their descent. 
longing to be, quote, quoting again to Kune Zohar, in the presence of the king to rise from their lowly state. In other words, as divine light and energy is found in this physical world, in this, in our space, in our world, as the light is found here to give this space life and vitality, it recognizes how lowly spiritually this realm is, and it wants at its core to go back home. Does this make sense? Thumbs up if, uh, if it makes sense so far. Okay, good. Let's continue. Now, the letter hey, the le which is the Shechina, which is Malchut, which is the name, which is the cup, which is speech, it's all the same. It's the energy that goes down. The letter hey, the life force of all creation, right? The, it's called letter hey, referring to the name in, of God's name, the Yud and hey and Vav and hey. It's the last letter hey that is the, the, the light that goes to create. So this letter hey, which is the life force of all creation, is called Shechina. Shechina means the divine presence, which means the indwelling. It's kind of like, it's not a light that's transcendent. It's a light or life force that's imminent, that's, um, that's inside. It's not outside, it's inside. Why is it called Shechina? For it descends to inhabit Bia. Bia is an acronym. The, the B-Y-A is an acronym for three worlds. Three worlds. Berea. Yitzira. Hold on. And Asiya. Bia. Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. These are the three lower worlds. The three worlds of creation, formation, and action. Okay, so that is where this, where this goes, where this life force flows. This letter He flows down, and it descends to inhabit all three levels, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. And it is written in Exodus, they shall make, God says, they shall make me a sanctuary, and I shall dwell, Veshachanti, Shechina, I will dwell in their midst. The chamber of the Holy of Holies, he says, in the ancient sanctuary, in the ancient um, tabernacle, was the primary dwelling of this, of this divine light. And from there, its radiance extended to give life to all creation. So what he's saying here is that the letter He is the life force of all creation. It's called the Shechina. And where was its headquarters on earth back in the day? It was in the chamber of the Holy of Holies in the temple. So that's the headquarters. And from there, the light continued to spread out to give life and vitality to this entire world from the headquarters. He gives an example, and this is what chapter 52 of Tanya does. And he quotes chapter 52 of Tanya here, which is something that in our Thursday night Tanya class, we actually recently studied. A few weeks ago, we were studying chapter 52. So for those of you that are part of the Thursday night crew, this sounds very familiar. By way of parallel, the soul, right? The soul, the human soul vivifies the body and is lodged primarily in the heart. You may, you may uh, be wondering if you study chapter 52, he says the primary dwelling is in the brain. And here he says the heart. The Rebbe addresses it in a footnote, but we're not going to deal with it right now. But he says here that it's primarily in the heart. And from there, from which, from which point it extends to all 248 organs of the body. In a similar fashion, just like it is biologically, he's bringing a biological example as an example of the physical, of the spiritual um, uh, reality in this world. Just like the soul, the human soul primarily lodges in the heart or the brain. And from there, it spreads out to the rest of the body. So too, the chamber of the Holy of Holies in the temple of old is the heart of the universe. As Zohar states, as the Zohar states, says in Kabbalah, therefore it was the site of the dwelling of the Shechina. So this letter, hey, Malchut, Shechina, divine speech, divine name, divine cup, whatever you want to call it, this life force of God that flows from the divine space into our lowly created space, first is headquartered back in the day in the Holy of Holies of the temple and then spreads out elsewhere. 
Tanya, chapter 52, ascribes the same character to the chamber of the Holy of Holies, of Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya. In each world, there is a headquarters of that world from which the light spreads out to the rest of the world. Let's continue. Let's continue. Oh, so what's the point? Hold on. Before we continue, now we're going to get into the moon. Hold on. Before we continue, so what's the point? The point is that you start off with this beautiful, pure light, this godly light that's in a godly space. Then you send the light on a mission. The letter hey, the Shechina, it's all the same energy, just different names. You send it down, 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 down to Bria, world of creation. Yetzira, world of formation. Asiya, the world of action. You send the light down, and in each world, it fills the world, and it gives life to the world. And then it comes to our world, to this physical space. And the divine light of Malchut is here, giving life to everything around us and us ourselves. And he says that induces, that calls forth from the light a thirst to go back home. The light is self-aware. The light is aware that it is in a hostile, spiritually hostile environment. It's in a foreign environment. It's not home, and it is homesick. It desires, it longs, it thirsts, to use the language of our discourse and the biblical language, it thirsts for its source. Back inside. He says, this also explains the story of the moon. This is the understanding of what God says to the moon when the moon complained about two kings in the sky. Go and diminish yourself. Diminution or diminution is descent, becoming a head to foxes. The spiritual light is now becoming a rosh l'shualim, a head to foxes. That, that's where the light is going. It's creating a fox, considered to be the sneakiest of all animals, right? Descending into Biyat to give them life, to give these worlds life, them plural, because it's multi three worlds here, Biyat. It did not want to go down and become diminished. Malchut, the moon, did not want to become diminished. It was just saying that there's no point, as I said before, with life, if, if, if the purpose, if the truth is so obvious. But it did not want to be cut, necessarily go down and become diminished because beyond these three worlds is a mixture of good and evil. And this is even more true with our world, the world of Asiya, the world of action. That's where we are, where man, human being, is given a choice, free choice. And he or she could even choose evil and thus bring down the godly life force into everything. Everything meaning even evil. A person who commits a crime, God forbid, committed that crime with energy and vitality and a soul and movement and power and force. And that is all powered by God, by this energy that comes into the world. And this person is schlepping. Schlepping means dragging, pulling, bringing down the godly life force into everything, even evil, similar to the verse in Proverbs. Her feet go down to death. Her feet, malchut, go down so far even to a space of death, doom, and gloom. And also similar to the verse, God or the Shrina is who dwells with them in the midst of their defilements. It's the same divine energy that's even in the midst of their defilements and impurity. Hence, he shall atone upon the sanctuary for the impurities of Israel. Right? That's why there has to be an atonement. Atonement also for the light that got schlepped into it. The light itself has become sullied, has become compromised on some level because it's become an accessory to the crime. Without the divine life force, no one exists and no one can do evil. So the fact that evil can be done is partly due to the life force flowing through that space. This explains the verse. He has contaminated the sanctuary of God. Through our choice, we have the power to bring the divine light even into evil spaces. 
Does that make sense? We have the ability to take God, to bring God into even a space of evil. So yes, the divine life force flows into this world, but this world is not evil. This world has a choice in which evil can be done. But when you and I, got not present company excluded, but when a human being chooses to do something evil, that brings that life force into that evil space. And that is a far cry from where it once was. This is the meaning of the exile of the Shekhinah. Shekhinah, again, is Malchut, divine presence, the light that comes into the world. There's, a, there's, there's words for the light that remains above the world. Shekhinah is the light, the divine light that comes, that goes down, 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 down into all the worlds, into our world, into the lowest of spaces. That's what it means. That's what the phrase exile the Shekhinah means. And this is caused by the evil actions of man below. As it states, for your sins, your mother was expelled. It's not literally mother. What it means is mother is malchut, is this energy. Because of your sins, you're schlepping your mother, your source of life, the divine life force, into exile. This refers to the descent of the life force of the letter He, as we described earlier, from stage to stage, lower and lower, until its flow was invested the 10th spirit of Noga. Noga is like this neutral creation of our world where things could go either way. That in turn issues flow and life force through the constellations and all the hosts of the heavens and their superiors to each living physical being in the world. So the life force flows, mother, feminine energy, Malchut, the moon, etc., flows lower and lower and lower. The 10 energies of Noga, which is again a neutral space that goes through the constellations, all the stars, until it creates every living physical being in this world, including the living physical beings in this world that can perpetrate evil. And when they perpetrate evil, then the life force becomes a party to that evil commission. And it, it in turn is now forced to power an evil act that goes against every, every fiber of its being. For this reason, it, the, the life force, the hay, the shrina, the malchot, right? That force, the mother, did not wish to descend and diminish itself. I know I explained the story a little bit differently before. It's not really different. That malchot was the moon was complaining that what's the point of creation if it's so obvious? So God said, okay, so now go diminish yourself. The moon said, uh-oh, what did I just do? Right? On the one hand, it wanted purpose. On the other hand, if now if there's purpose, that means there's darkness. Now there's free choice. Now it could go the other way. Be careful what you wish for. You wanted a world in which there was meaning. That means that there's risk. And if there's risk, it can go into an evil space as well. And if it goes into an evil space, that means that you, Malchut, Moon, Shrina, Mother Energy, now you are going to be schlepped into, pulled into, dragged into a space of evil as well. Now, it Robert? doesn't mean that it's irredeemable. It doesn't mean that it can't bounce back. It doesn't mean that there's a greater upside than the downside. What it means is simply this, that Malchut, as it enlivens this world, and everything in it, and as sometimes it's schlepped down into horrible, ugly places, Malchut inside is kicking and screaming. It doesn't mean that Malchut also can't exult and rejoice in those times where it does pay, where the investment does pay off, where the light that it that it's shining into this world becomes magnified through our actions of good and our good choices. And now Malchut's like the journey was worth it. That doesn't take away from those moments, but there are moments in which it feels like this was a terrible, terrible situation where the light is completely being misappropriated 
for evil. It's being misused and abused, and it finds itself in those dark and ugly places where it does not want to be. This is how we explain, according to Kabbalah, the notion that the moon, sorry, that Malchut, also the moon, Malchut is in a state of spiritual thirst. It yearns for its source. So the last two weeks we explained this because Malchut is the lowest of the energies and it's the most relatable to the world. So therefore it thirsts to be in its source. But today we went much further. We said not only is Malchut forward facing, Malchut is the energy that ultimately flows into all of those dark places, including the, 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 the secret spaces of this planet, of this earth. The nefarious places. And thus, Malchut existentially is in a state of thirst, wanting to go back up. And yes, there will be victories. There will be moments of nachas, moments of joy, but there will also be moments of pain that really evoke the sense of thirst of Malchut. Now, why are we saying all this? What's the point? Well, what's the bigger picture here? Okay, so now we understand how where the energy of this world comes from and how you know the stakes are high. Are we going to utilize the energy? I mean, that's really the upshot of today, right? Are we going to utilize the energy that God has given us, this Malchut moon energy? Are we going to utilize it for the purpose, which is to do the right thing with our own choice? Or are we going to misappropriate the energy? And that's a choice that you and I make. And if we've misappropriated the energy, are we going to come back and use it again for something good and reclaim it? That's, that's where we come in. But what's the bigger picture? What's the point? So a few weeks ago, I mentioned the question, how does evil prosper? So now we have an answer. Evil prospers because it's given access to Malchut energy. The energy that flows into the world is very non-discriminatory. It flows into every space of this world, good, bad, or ugly. And so those that choose to do things that aren't good also have access to the energy, equal access to the energy. But as we continue this conversation, we're going to see that there's something, an even greater, not greater, an even, um, um, an even more devious truth behind this all. And that is that everything we've set up until now represents the normative flow of energy from source to creation. But there's a way to bypass this flow. There's a way to bypass the malchut energy because at the end of the day, the malchut energy is a diminished form of energy that lessens itself less and less and less until it gets into this world. But there's a way to hack the system and go to the source and take or steal a large amount of energy, divine energy from the source, which is what we are going to continue exploring in the subsequent chapters of our text. So what's a lesson from today? Recognize that the pain in the world, the challenge of the world is its greatest asset. The fact that this world is so difficult to navigate is itself the greatest blessing, the blessing of purpose and meaning and really having, having a function. Because if the world was easy to navigate, then this would all be a program, this would all be robotic, and you and I would not have a purpose. The fact that it is difficult means that we have a purpose. We share, we are partners in creation, and what we do truly matters. How we think truly matters. What we say truly matters. Let's remember that we play a pivotal role in this experiment called life, called creation, called existence. And that we determine, literally through our choices, we determine whether or not this mission is successful or the opposite. Let us be inspired through the trust that God has placed into our hands to choose wisely and to make God proud. Thank you for joining me today for Kabbalah and Coffee. I hope the message has resonated with you. I hope you enjoyed the story of the moon and its debate or dialogue or kvetching, its complaint with God. And, uh, and I hope that it was inspiring to recognize the power that we all have. Again, the book that we're studying is Overcoming Folly. I actually have my book out of its jacket just for
convenience sake for today. Um, but if you're interested, you might be able to find this online somewhere. Um, it's not in print, but it might be available used. Also, another quick announcement. Last week, we started a fantastic new course called This Can Happen. We're going to jump into lesson two this week. If you haven't yet jumped on board, it's not too late. I can set you up with the recording of, of lesson one, and you can jump right into lesson two this week. We do it Tuesday nights or Thursday afternoons, two options. You can jump right in. We're exploring the concept of Mashiach, the Messianic era, the ultimate destiny of the world from a uniquely Jewish perspective. Yeah, the other takes on the Messiah are out there, well-documented, what others believe. But what do we believe? As the source of Mashiach, as the source of this concept, what do Jews believe? Will the real Messiah please stand up? Last week, we explored the Messianic era um, on a physical level, what are the physical promises, the physical blessings, the physical goodness that's going to happen? We saw how the world is better than ever um, and headed toward that direction. This week, we look at the spiritual side of Mashiach, the spiritual side of the Messiah, the idea of a temple and an gathering of the exiles. And we'll talk about the spiritual state of reality and talk about spiritual progress as well. So that's this week on This Can Happen Tuesday nights and Thursday afternoon. One more thing to mention. One week from tomorrow night, we have a very special event, and the event is called From Auschwitz to the IDF. And I'm going to share an image, if I can find it. I'm going to share an image of this. Hold on. I don't know if this is coming up at all. Nope, I don't see this. Stop share. Why can't I see it? Did you guys see a picture of the IDF thing or no? No. Uh, Let me see if I can find this on my computer. Hold on. Oh, there we go. At least I see it on my end. Now let me see if you can see it on your end. Nope. Still not. Okay. Well, it's somewhere on my computer that's deciding not to show up. So be that as it may, um, what are you going to do? But there's, a, there's an event uh, a week from tomorrow night that is, it, it features a young man who is a, an, an Israel Defense Forces veteran. He grew up in, a, in the United States, went to Israel to defend his, his country, his homeland, the Jewish state, and he was inspired by his grandfather's, um, his grandfather's survival of the camps um, in, in the, during the Holocaust, during World War II, that motivated him, that inspired him to risk his own life to defend his homeland and his people. And it's, he's incredibly inspiring. He has just incredible stories of combat, of the stuff that he was involved with in Israel. And he's gonna speak about that and speak about his grandfather's story, which is, absolutely incredible as well. In fact, if you're familiar with the, the Chabad Siddur, there's a spoiler alert, which may or may not be good to share. The Chabad Siddur, translated by Rabbi Nisan Mengel, that's his grandfather. His grandfather is a survivor. He's also an author, a translator, a Chabad rabbi. His father's a Chabad rabbi, and he's going to be sharing his story next week. You don't want to miss this. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, my friends, um, it's great to see you all. I wish I could have shared that image with you, but you can find it on our website in Tangent. Yeah, I put the link. I put the link to the RSV oh, page. Awesome. Well, that <laughs> see, that's gonna work. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> so Donna put in the chat a link to that event so you can click on it, check it out. He is in Los Angeles, he lives in Los Angeles, this young man. He's gonna be, we're gonna be doing this on Zoom. So wherever you are, you can join and be part of it. It begins at 8 p.m., I believe, 8 p.m next Monday night. So not tomorrow night, but a week from tomorrow night, it's going to be fantastic. Also, I want to tell you that we're planning a lot of really amazing um, events and, and, and things coming up. So stay tuned for more exciting classes and events here at In Town Jewish Academy. All right. Um, I want to wish you all a Shavua Tov, a wonderful week, lots of blessings. Enjoy the light of the sun, but also the divine light and the energy that fills our lives and our homes and make sure to utilize the potential for good. 
All right, it's great to see you. Donna, Ekaterina, welcome. First time at Kabbalah and Coffee, welcome. David, welcome to the family of Kabbalah. David, welcome. Tony, Susan, Mariana, good to see you. Sandrine, Joy, Toba, Alex, Yaakov, and Adam. It's been great to study together. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. We'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Beautiful Pleasure. class. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.